much, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Rach. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here today. Uh, my name is Tucker. I'm the Director of Customer Success at User Interviews. We've got a great discussion queued up for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, our presenters, who I'll introduce in a second, are eager to take your questions um, throughout. Um, so put those questions in the Zoom Q&A, uh, and you can actually upvote questions in that Q&A, um, and we'll get the most voted questions answered. We're gonna do our best to answer one question per slide, um, and then we'll answer as many as we can at the end. Uh, we are also recording the whole webinar, and we'll share it with you as soon as we can, uh, probably early next week. We had over 500 people register for today's webinar. Uh, so clearly, remote research and remote research in the midst of a health crisis is a topic that a lot of us are thinking about. Really excited to have with me today Slack's Bezad Sirjani and our own John Henry Forrester. I'm gonna let these guys introduce themselves and take it away. JH. Sure, um, so I head up product at User Interviews, been doing that for about three years now. Um, we're a fully remote team, you know, even in the before times. Uh, so, um, you know, we do all of our work and research remotely, so a lot of experience there, and then in previous experiences, um, you know, dabbled with some in-person research as well. So it's been cool to see the contrast and um, happy to explore this topic with Bezad and see what questions we get. So uh, Bezad, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Bezad. I lead the operations team for research and analytics at Slack. I've been there for about two and a half, almost three years now. Um, and Slack, for those of you who don't know, is a, a collaboration hub where we try to make your life uh, simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And prior to Slack, I spent about four years at Facebook working on business tools, video, and hardware. I'm excited to chat with y'all today about remote research in the time of COVID-19. <laughs> Cool. So in terms of what we were hoping to cover today, um, we did just want to kind of highlight that, you know, this is an opportunity of sorts. Uh, all research kind of has to be remote right now, given the circumstances. And so, you know, wanting to lean into uh, how to make the most of op that opportunity and, and what kind of constraints you might need to navigate around. Um, additionally, you know, a couple COVID-19 specific considerations, given that everyone's, you know, a little extra stressed out and, and some, there's some different dynamics at play than usual. Um, <clears throat> Then we'll transition to just some remote research best practices in general, uh, things that we've learned and think are, you know, worth everyone knowing if, if you're not familiar with this type of research. And um, even if you are, maybe there's some new tips in there that you can pick up. Uh, talk about tools. Uh, so, you know, user interviews will be part of that, but also we know there's a wide set of tools out there for facilitating this stuff. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of veer off and talk about other stuff as well. And then kind of throughout, we were hoping to do some Q and A. Um, so, to the extent that um, people have questions, um, as Carrie mentioned or Tucker mentioned, uh, there's a Q&A uh, option in Zoom, so please use that so that we can upvote. Um, the hope is, is that kind of as we hit each section, we'll grab a question or two and, and field them real time so they're in context. Um, we probably won't see them in the chat since it goes by pretty fast, so, uh, so please take advantage of the Q&A. Uh, we'd love to kind of make this interactive and, and field questions as we go. Um, awesome. So with that, let's, uh, let's get into it. So embracing the opportunity and constraints. Um, so, you know, we've kind of, as I mentioned, this is a chance to discover the benefits of remote research if, if you haven't already. And uh, we'll let Bezad kind of chime in with some of the specifics that he's been familiar with. Yeah, so I think a lot of people think about remote research as being um, more efficient or more cost effective. And while I think that can be true, I do, want to remind people that you know all research has a cost it costs you something it costs participants something their time energy etc um, so be mindful of those costs but one of the things that is great about remote research is that if people have a internet connection then they can participate and so that opens up tons of doors for both moderated and unmoderated forms of research um, it is very closely connected to that next point which is around participant diversity and inclusion so for those of us who are familiar with doing lots of in-person work especially where we have usability labs or research labs in our offices we're often geographically constrained or constrained in some way to people who can actually make it in to our offices or have the ability to let us go and visit them somewhere and i don't know about you but i don't often have time during my day to just hop on a call with another company or 
like dip out of work and go participate in a research session. So a lot of research is actually quite exclusive in that way. And remote research opens up the opportunity for you to be much more inclusive and much more open and include people who have different types of abilities and characteristics that have probably been excluded from a lot of your work. Um, so I would encourage you to be mindful of that and intentional in thinking about how you can be more um, inclusive in that kind of recruiting. The other thing that I think a lot of us are going through as we're in this time is that certain tools are um, harder or different to use than we expected and certain tools do and don't play together very well. And so one of the interesting things that you should explore as you're doing remote work is um, how easy is it to be using the tools that you normally use? I think one of the great things about this time is that a lot of people are constrained to working from home. And so what that means is that they don't have the same environment that they've been doing their work in in an office. And so one of the things that you can really spend time thinking about if you work in enterprise or in consumer is just how different is it to be using these tools or to be doing these in different environments. And instead of looking at that as a challenge because they're not in their office or they're not in the typical environment that your application or software product is being used, embrace that and use that moment where they are hyper aware of those differences to dig in and say, hey, look, if you're normally using this product in an office right now, you're not in an office, you're not around your teammates, you don't have maybe super fast internet or whatever else is great about being in an office, how does this feel? How does it work differently for you now, given where you are and what's going on? And another thing that's really exciting and challenging about remote research is that there are lots of method constraints. So if you've been trained in a lot of things that have to do with in-person or um, nonverbal communication, if you're watching people do things and you're observing, if you're used to having a dialogue where you can feed off of people's energy and hear their breath and pay attention to sort of their smaller movements, all of that is gone in remote research, right? Where you and I are in a conversation like this and I have to basically pay attention to what I can see, which has some sort of latency in what I can hear. And so you wanna think about where that helps and hurts your research in the design, in the planning, in the tools that you're choosing, the questions you're asking, even the stimuli that you're exposing people to. Are there ways that you want to make sure that you're watching people do something? Do you want to watch them do the thing like in terms of using a piece of software, do you want them to be, do you want to have a shared experience watching that screen? Do you want to watch the screen and them? And there's just a lot of considerations that you need to make as you're planning that study. Um, because right now you're in a, a probably very different environment that is mediated through a screen. And so the thing I would, I would encourage all of you to do is really think about how to try new things. Um, there are lots of great free tools out there to record and share video, to get on um, and share screens together, things like Google Slides or even Figma where you can collaboratively design. Um, think about what are some of the elements of the study that are important and how can you achieve that in our new sort of mediated environment. Yeah, totally. On the, on the creativity piece, um, one idea that might be worth taking a look at is there's a lot of uh, thought leadership being shared right now around how to work with your colleagues remotely in, in that people share tools and techniques and other ideas. And you might be able to borrow and steal from some of those uh, for your research needs, depending on you know what exactly you need to get done. So that's a good place to go find inspiration as well that uh, might not be immediately obvious. Um, the other thing too that uh, I always find is nice when you're doing stuff remotely um, is that the participants are on their own device. And so you get to get a little extra signal and stuff that sometimes you may not. Like maybe they get a flurry of notifications all the time or they come into your app through their email always. And like that's an interesting little tidbit you might not have gotten in a more controlled environment where they come in and you already have it set up on a test machine or something like that. So um, there are like little like ethnographic type things that you can get out of it. Or uh, I think Faisal, you touched on this. Um, maybe they're in an environment that's very distracting, like uh, kids are running around and other stuff. And so when they're trying to use your product or service in that environment, you know, you can pick up on some challenges that maybe you weren't top of mind until, until seeing that. So, um, you know, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of interesting things that can come out of that. Uh, Tucker, any questions on this topic uh, before we move on? Yeah, and, um, just again, to reference Q&A, it's, it's really neat. And thanks to all of you for who are, uh, who are putting questions in there and uploading them. Um, so the first I'll mention, in, you kind of talked around this a bit, was uh, how do you arrange remote user testing of a mobile app? Yeah, I think there's actually a great answer to that question above in terms of doing contextual inquiry. Um, 
I think a lot of this, and, and I'm going to say this as we get a little bit further into the presentation, but um, I think all good research has to be answering a decision. And so I think if you're thinking about testing an app, the question is like, what decision are you trying to make? Is it about how usable something is? Is it about understanding people's reactions to content, to messages, to interactions? Um, there are tools out there like dscout, uh, user testing, the user zoom, lots of tools that allow you to do moderated and unmoderated um, mobile tests. And so if you're looking to explore even feedback from quick testing, heat maps, et cetera, lots of different stuff out there, but I would encourage you to structure it based on um, how to actually get that work done. One of the things that I've done in uh, my graduate school days, is called laptop hugging. And so, um, I'm going to demonstrate if you have a mobile device, this is like the very low fidelity way of doing this. And you literally have someone hold their phone in front of a laptop and you basically kind of hug the laptop while you do things. Um, it's not the most beautiful way to do research, but <laughs> it gets the job done. Um, and so. you get to use it, reference laptop hugging, which is a great phrase. Yeah. Exactly. I do want to quickly address, um, I'm going to say your name wrong, Vale's question right below. Um, <laughs> the question was, how does remote research open up to people with different degrees of ability? Wouldn't it also exclude some participants because of physical or cognitive challenges, age-related lack of comfort with digital tools? Totally. There are going to be people who are excluded in this new type of research, just the same way that there are people who are excluded from physical in-person work. Um, but I would encourage you to check out tools like Fable, which actually specialize in accessibility research and specialize in helping you identify and source participants who have certain types of abilities and disabilities to improve the quality of your product for those audiences. Um, it's definitely gonna be more difficult to find people who are uncomfortable using digital tools. And I've, worked, I've talked with research leaders right now who wholesale can't do work with their certain populations. And so they're trying to get creative with other ways that they can synthesize in information already, or even do sort of design exercises within the company to, to learn. Um, so there's no, there's no silver bullet here, but there are companies that are working to address um, and help connect products and services with people who can help improve those on a variety of axes. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we're going to cover tools uh, again later, so we'll get into a lot of that um, yeah. as well, which I think will be super useful because it seems to be um, you know, top of mind for a lot of folks. So anyways, uh, let's keep it moving. I think um, I'm playing a dangerous game here, fielding questions <laughs> and keeping us on time. So uh, I'm going to do my best to keep us going. Um, so obviously, the world's a little different right now. I <laughs> think that's no surprise to everyone. Um, and we did want to acknowledge that. And so um, Bezad had a couple like, you know, specific considerations to keep in mind uh, while you're doing research um, you know, in a global pandemic. Yeah, I, th I think the biggest thing is, you know, we, no, one, no one exists to give you product feedback, right? No one, none of us are, are walking around in the world saying, oh, I really just want to give companies feedback on their products. Um, so I would encourage you to like, just be kinder and more patient and more human than you think you should be because everyone is going through something different and that will be more or less visible to you in general. Um, I like when it comes to research, be prepared for last minute changes for sessions being cut short, higher drop off rates, because people are going to be living their lives and prioritizing things accordingly. And like you want them to do that because that's the thing that's going to help them get through the situation. Um, I think for you as a researcher, what that means is that you need to be more patient and think about the emotional arc that you normally go through in a study what it looks like to build rapport and to get people comfortable. And you probably have to stretch that out a bit. Spend some time understanding where they're at, what it's like being at home, like figure out how to open up and be vulnerable with them so that you can create a safe space. And if you realize that actually they're not in a place to, to participate in research, just be human with them for the amount of time that you had booked in the study, right? Maybe all that you can do for them is sit, listen, and be kind. And for them, that'll be enough. Totally. Um, and I think there's a few more, um, yeah, it, more of kind of what you just said. The, the thing that um, is a little bit different just from my own experience, um, and it's not a direct example from the coronavirus situation, but uh, working previously in an in-office situation, and then, you know, occasionally I'd work from home and I would call into stuff. There's this real like pressure to like maintain like an office level of like professionalism and, you know, be somewhere quiet and not have uh, anyone else in my house or anything in the background. And now that I work in a fully remote team, um, that just goes away, like as you're comfortable, like you see someone's pet in the background, and you're like saying hi, or like their loved one walks by and you wave because you know them and like, you just get used to it. And so I think um, being a little bit more flexible with um, 
you know, a little bit more humanness and maybe dropping the professionalism down a level just as we go through the situation um, is maybe useful just in general to, to kind of meet people where they're at. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing I would say there is, um, in general, as we're moving into this world, over communicating is really important. And I, I would encourage you to over communicate with your team and be better about setting expectations for what the rules of engagement are in the study. I often have a Slack channel open with my team as I'm doing research. So as I'm on an interview call, the team can be dropping questions in there. Um, that may look different for you. And I, I'd encourage you to think about what that means in terms of just like how you want to interact with the team. If they were going to be on the call with a participant, what the rules of engagement are, are they allowed to ask or not? And just be really explicit about those things because we're all kind of in a new situation and you are probably the person who's most trained to handle that situation and know what the like course of the conversation will be. Totally. All right. So um, let's move into just some general best practices. Um, I think you've touched on this a little bit, but uh, maybe just to dive a little deeper here. Yeah, this one, this we can go pretty quick. Um, don't do research for no reason. Um, like, especially in this time, right? All research should have a purpose. As I mentioned, all research has a cost. Nobody exists to give you product feedback. Um, and when it comes to picking the right approach, um, I am going to do a shameless plug for myself. I gave a talk last year at Strive called Don't Start With Data. That's all about how I screw up research. And I think having a plan for the research that you're doing based on why you're doing that research is really important. And it's even more important as you're inviting people to participate in this time, you should be really clear about what it is that you are trying to learn from them and how it's gonna improve their life and their experience with the product in some way. Um, and given that remote has just a whole bunch of opportunities for moderated and unmoderated tools, being really clear about the kind of research that you wanna do and like that will help pick the tool and the approach and make the rest of your life a lot easier. Totally. It's just one of those ones where I think sometimes we've heard, we've heard from people of like, you know, we do this great research, but it's not having an impact in the organization or I'm having people get buy-in. And it, it, it always comes back to like, was there upfront alignment on what you were trying to learn? Um, or did you go out and just talk to a bunch of people? Because if you can get people in the organization rallied around what you're trying to learn, and then you actually learn that thing, it's a lot easier to start getting the buy-in from, from what the results of that research were. So having a reason for the research is always just so, so important. Um, Tucker, any uh, questions that are relevant to this uh, section? We've got a lot of interest from Ian's question about um, how to best do a contextual inquiry remotely. I don't know if now's the right time to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I think we can talk about this to some extent. One question I would ask you is, does the context still apply? So for, for my team, one of the things that we think about is like how people work. And so some of the questions that we were asking about work environments actually have to change because the work environment has changed. And so the questions that we ask about office dynamics or the interplay between being next to someone and working online like it is no longer relevant. I would incur, I would imagine that for some of you who work on products and services where the business may be closed or has radically shifted, the kind of context that you can inquire about also is really different. And so I would start with a question of like, can you still do it? Mm -hmm. um, there are many of the best contextual inquiries that I've seen done remotely look like diary studies where people are contributing multimedia responses to various prompts. It could be, I'm going to record, you know, the first hour of my day and they sit with their phone camera on, or I'm going to take photos of specific things that are important to whatever the prompt is. Um, again, I think it, it can range depending on whether you work on a consumer product, a hardware, or a hardware product, et cetera. Um, but Think about how to structure the work that you're doing based on the kind of data that you need to connect, collect, the frequency of it, the media type, whether it's their written responses, observations, video, self-reflections, et cetera. Um, and there are a range of products for um, DScout being one of them for diary studies. You can also have people use things like Loom where they record their own videos and can kind of do work on a screen and send those videos to you um, or post them. So. Lots of different ways to try that. And it looks like some other people are chiming in with, with great answers as well. Awesome. Um, cool. So I think one that is probably going to feel familiar to people, um, we can do remote, uh, you might have a little bit of this. Um, how, do, how do people <laughs> manage through this situation, Bezad? Yeah, so th this we, we sort of hinted at, but um, I imagine that for many of you, conversations are going to feel a little bit different and difficult. Um, I've spent more than half of probably all the research I've done in my life doing remote research. And so I'm a little bit more patient when it comes to the first few minutes of a call being, oh, we're still waiting for Joe or, hey, Sandy's on the line. Like, um, 
it's going to be different because you don't have all the same cues and stimuli that you can use in person. And so again, be patient with yourself, be patient with them. One of the things that I like to do in the first few kind of 30 seconds to a minute of a call is try to get a sense of the latency on the internet. So I actually right now can kind of tell how good John Henry and I are able to talk because we were talking before this call started. So I know sort of what the delay is, but often very early on, I try to determine how much delay there is between me and the other person so that as I'm pausing, I can account for that in my pauses and it feels less like I'm talking over them, which is something I try to be really attuned to as we're having those things. Um, but the other thing I would say very pragmatically is just be more patient and plan a little bit more time because all of this is going to take a little bit longer. So if you're used to doing 30 minute calls, maybe try going to 45. If you're used to doing 45 minute calls, maybe make them an hour um, because all of this is going to be a little bit weird, uh, a little bit new. And you want to just account for that and calibrate as you get better over time. Yeah, I think that's that's huge. I think the other things that come to mind for me and my experience are just, um, you know, treat the instructions you're sending people ahead of time almost as like a product that you're iterating on as well. Like if the first ones you send, people are pretty confused and don't know how to join, you can tweak it and try to make it the that cleaner and like, you know, pay attention to that kind of stuff. It really matters. Similarly, like if you know people have common issues that they don't know how to share their screen or whatever, maybe you have a couple uh, things written up ahead of time that you can copy and paste into the chat that they coach somebody through it, stuff like that. So um, anything you can do to kind of hedge and, and get ahead um, also are really helpful, but also now we're all like <laughs> video conferencing experts uh, during the quarantine. So maybe this will, uh, maybe this will get easier. <laughs> we'll see. Um, cool. Uh, another one that you had kind of alluded to a little bit um, before, Bezad, but um, would have, would love to kind of get into it a little bit more detail. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that's great about remote research is that you can see what I'm choosing to show you. And so what you don't see right now is that I also have an internet browser open with our slides so I can see what's coming next. And I have a little browser open with Q&A and I have a browser open with my notes. And so one of the things is like totally embrace the situation that you're in and over plan and over communicate. So one of the things that I'm thinking about is there are certain things I wanted to make sure I mentioned. I have those all here written as notes. I want to know what's coming next so that I can adjust my questions or responses. I have that up. Um, I, for a lot of remote participants, when I can, I have them do pre-work because I really value people's time and I want to make sure that the time that we're spending together is going to be helpful. So if I need to learn something to shape my discussion guide, or if I want to understand maybe their work experience so that I can make sure that they're showing the right stimuli in a session, I'll just make sure that those emails go out beforehand. If I start running into issues with Zoom or with, you know, Google Hangouts or whatever, I then will send out emails to all our participants and say, hey, things are taking a little bit longer than we thought, or the internet has been a little bit wonky, or you know, whatever it is. Um, and I try to do that to everyone who's involved because you know, things happen. My internet's gone down a couple times over the past few weeks, and I had to adjust meetings based on that. Um, so I think over planning and over communicating is really helpful. Similarly with my teams, what I used to do for remote calls is I'll say, hey, if, if I'm not online in 10 minutes, something has probably gone wrong. And I would encourage one of you, and I would pick someone and say, Hey, Lu Chen, you're going to be the person who hops online and says, hey, you know, we've been waiting for Bezad, we think something's going wrong, et cetera. Um, and just like really think about how to account for those things. Um, the other thing that people, I think, fail to do, and this is a question, um, what's the most often made mistake when remote user testing? Um, I think a lot of people assume that you can nudge people that you're talking to in the same ways that you do in person but you have way less uh, like stimuli coming through and way less nonverbal communication. So I try to spend more time upfront saying, you know, I'm really here to just get your perspective. I'm looking for your feedback. And I will often repeat things that they're saying. I will, you know, in double back on stuff and make sure that I'm really over communicating. So like, hey, John, I heard that you say this, did you mean this? Or can you dive into that a little bit more? Um, because I want to make sure that they know in, in every way I can communicate that I'm here for them and I'm excited for the work that we're doing and that they're being a valuable use of my time and hopefully their time. Um, and I think a lot of people just under communicate, which is, is not as, it's a natural thing to do because you're used to doing in-person work. Um, uh, yeah, a few from my side, yeah. I'll toss on our, um, if you were going to record like tell that to the person ahead of time and like try to get their consent before the session. Cause then there's two things. One, you want to be like set expectations and let them know that that's going to happen. You don't want to blindside them Two, If you wait, uh, people always either forget to get, get consent or forget to hit record. So like make that as upfront as possible. Um, 
who else is going to be in the session? Like be mindful of the dynamics of that. If it's like in Zoom and they're going to see a ton of people with their camera off, that can be kind of intimidating. Do you need that many people in the session? Can they watch the recording or whatever? Um, that's a good thing to coordinate with your team. And then the last one I'll say is um, whatever channel you are communicating with the participant ahead of time through, whether that's email, you know, Slack, text, whatever, keep that open and available when the session time comes around. Because I've had times where like it's 10 minutes in and it feels like a no-show and then I finally check my email and like the link I sent is broken or something like that. And so you want to be able to like, if the person's trying to reach out to you because they're having an issue, you want to see that in real time so you can correct it. So um, that's another one to, to be mindful of. Um, yeah, that, oh, I was going to say, the, the, consent, the consent thing is huge. And I, I actually encourage a lot of the people I work with, and, and I'm going to encourage all of you to, to get kind of double opt-in consent. So often I will ask for consent in the beginning to record something. And then before we finish, I will ask for consent again to use it. Because yeah. so with emotional subjects, you can definitely get to the point where they realize they started sharing things and then they don't want to share anymore or they're, they're not interested in not being used. And that's 100 percent their choice. And so in this time that we are in, I would encourage you to again at the end of a session like, hey, I was, I'm so grateful for the time that we spent together. As I mentioned at the beginning, I had recorded this. How are you feeling about the you know, using this <laughs> to inform whatever? And, and often I give people a few options. One is you can use this to just like shape your thinking. One is you can use this, but don't cite anything about me, which for us is typically like company or job title or, Hey, yes, this is great. You can show the video clip or the quote or whatever and attribute it to me. And I think that's really important given the emotional state of the world right now to just be a little bit more empathetic in doing that. Yeah, that's a great one. I, um, the thing I was gonna say too, is we talked about trade-offs of, you know, pros and cons of in-person versus remote. A really nice piece about remote is that the recording is kind of, so like baked in and passive right and so you get the consent and you hit the button and it just sort of happens as part of the conversation whereas in person you have to figure out how exactly you're going to do it are there going to be microphones present it can feel a little more, more intimidating and or be additional equipment or logistics to figure out whereas uh you know in this type of setting it's kind of just included so um getting consent and then taking advantage of it is is a nice pro of uh, the remote dynamic um, tucker uh, what questions we got yeah, other than obviously getting consent and Biz had great comments there on the double consent. Um, what about Carmen's question here, which is when you're having the participants share their device, what privacy issues should uh, the researcher be thinking about? Yeah, I, I would encourage you to work with um, your legal teams on this because I think every company differs quite a bit. Um, I would start by thinking about like what is ethical to do and then how do you protect participants first and foremost. Um, one of the challenges with the situation that we're in is that we often can't test things that we're potentially worried about being shared in the wild or going public because <clears throat> you don't have control once you've given it to a participant to put on their device. So that will change some of the research you do. Um, but I would always encourage you to think about like what is the most, like what's the best thing for the participant in terms of their safety and protecting their privacy. And then work with your legal team, especially now to understand if you need to change any sorts of policies or practices to make sure that both parties are safe. Yeah, a, a few things too in the, in the instructions you might be providing, uh, you know, t depending on the software you're using, telling them how to just share maybe the window that you need to see instead of the whole desktop. Uh, you know, Macs and PCs usually have ways to turn off notifications so you don't see anything pop up that you shouldn't. Because um, we definitely, I've definitely heard stories of people seeing some things that are, you know, uh, interesting. Um, 100%. Yeah, so those are good ones. And then the other thing too that uh, you can do sometimes is some software allows you to share your screen and then let the other person drive with their mouse. So like you could actually host the prototype or host the whatever on your device, uh, share your screen, but let them drive, you know, using their uh, inputs controls, which is another yep. way that takes some of that out of the equation. Cause now it's your screen that's being shared. They're just able to control it. So again, there's different software solutions for that type of stuff, but that kind of avoids some of the problem altogether as well. Cool. Um, all right. So um, tools <laughs> have been a, uh, it seems like a, a big topic of discussion. It's been cool to see all the tools that um, other uh, attendees have mentioned. There's been some new ones that I'm learning about, so I'm gonna make the list here myself and go check some of these out afterwards. Um, I'll just give a quick kind of overview uh, of how we can help on the user interview side, and then uh, we'll open it up to talk about any tool that um, people are curious about or, or you know, a specific need and what kind of tools are good for that. Um, so in the user interview side, we recruit you know, for online and over the phone studies. We can target people from the US and Canada. Uh, you can do it from specific geographies plus any additional criteria you have. So if you're doing the sessions remotely, but you only want to talk to people in Kansas for some reason, maybe you know, you're only licensed to do business there or whatever it may be, uh, we can help you with that type of stuff. Um, we make it really easy to 
write up your instructions and all the test details once, and then those automatically get uh, pushed out to anybody who's confirmed, and we send a reminder, you know, the day of, so we can automate a lot of the kind of annoying parts that come with this. Um, and then again, we are flexible in terms of one-on-one uh, -on -one studies, focus groups, moderated, unmoderated. Um, the one thing I will just stress is we are basically the matchmaker and like the logistics handler. So we will find you the right people, we'll get them scheduled, we'll send reminders, handle payments, all that sort of stuff. Um, but in terms of actually facilitating the session, uh, you would need to use another tool. So you know, if you're gonna do it one-on-one -on -one over video, you might use Zoom, you might use other stuff. Um, so uh, the facilitation is a little bit open-ended and um, so that, I think that's where a lot of the questions are. So we can, uh, we can definitely dig into you know, what tools are useful for different use cases. Um, so uh, Beza, do you wanna touch on any of your favorite tools before we answer some questions? Um, I feel like I've, I've dropped a bunch of tools. I think that um, I've probably been limited in my exposure and I'm, I'm learning about a bunch of tools as we're doing this because Facebook and Slack have had certain agreements <laughs> in place. Um, but there are, are lots of really great tools out there. Um, I think my favorite, like non-research research tool right now is Loom, which allows people to record themselves, themselves, their desktop or themselves in their desktop and post that online. Um, so it's like a great asynchronous video thing. I'll often use it actually for uh, tutorials and how to's. So when I trained people in my team on Qualtrics, I recorded a lot of the Qualtrics tutorials in Loom and just posted those instead of the instructions. But there's, there's lots of great stuff. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so what, uh, what questions do we have? Seems like people, uh... Yeah, we've got 18 questions, which is great. Um, and before we get into those, I'll just mention that um, we'll do a, like a roll up of all the tools mentioned today, and we'll we'll put those tools in uh, email we send later uh, early next week with links to all that stuff, so you guys can have them in any place. Cool. Um, James, you just want to go top to bottom as long as you're yeah. yeah. So uh, the top one I just saw it looked like it moved around, but um, was a struggle can be. Uh, being on the screen and also taking digital notes at the same time, uh, Zoom and script, yep. Uh, for one person research team, what solutions would you suggest for note taking, especially if there's no time to go through recorded sessions later? Um, yeah, that's a great one. Uh, based on any uh, tips on how to facilitate and take notes simultaneously? Yeah, I typically was, um, I've done this different ways, and I, I think that you should develop a note-taking solution that works best for you. I, I do think split screening is really helpful. I have sort of three panels of stuff going on right now. One of the things that I typically did in terms of note-taking was not writing everything, but I would write uh, like a keyword and then the time, and then I would go back to that part of the interview. So I used to have, um, I used to write juicy quote for things that I thought were like really fascinating and interesting, and so I'd write like juicy quote 206. And I would just go back to the video for that part and listen like 30 seconds before and, you know, the couple minutes of that part. Um, but yeah, I, I think I totally feel your pain going back through eight hours of session videos is very time consuming. Um, there are different tools. I think Zoom itself lets you transcribe recorded sessions. There are other tools that do that. So if one of your biggest concerns is transcription and being able to search through that so you don't have to take as many notes or notes in the same way, I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, I also would encourage you to think about what are like shorthands or ways that you can make note of what's important um, <clears throat> so that you can just go back specifically to those times. But yeah, splitting your screen or, or even like taking notes on paper potentially, um, which is what I did for a, a long time in addition to sort of having a script and a, a video being next to each other. Um, yeah, I will say it's, it's really hard to do both, to be like an active listener and be really engaged and take notes. So, even if you're only a research team of one, if you can find somebody else on the team and bring them into the process and have them take notes, um, it's super helpful. Um, and it's also nice for people usually to get some more exposure to your users and, and what they're saying. Like I've had engineers come in and take notes and that's been really fun and, and interesting. Um, I do think the transcription stuff is like probably, transcription plus the timestamps is a really good one. Uh, I think somebody mentioned Otter AI, that's a great one. Uh, Descript is actually a podcast tool, but has a really cool interface for editing and seeing uh, conversations and, and they transcribe them for you. That could be one worth checking out. A lot of these have some free minutes too, where you can uh, transcribe you know, a couple hours a month of, of recordings and you can see which one you like. Um, yeah, great, Grain, which got mentioned in there. I, I know Mike, the CEO, is a fantastic tool. Um, I didn't realize where they were in the beta process, but Grain is excellent. Cool, yeah, so to the extent, like most of us are not like, uh, court stenographers. So if you are trying to take notes and facilitate, I would try to figure out shorthands or timestamps or something that lets you type less. Um, 
because if you're trying to transcribe it yourself and do the facilitation, it's, it's just a really hard combo and, and you're not really setting yourself up for success. Um, both in terms of like your notes probably aren't going to be great quality. And then the sessions are probably going to suffer in quality too, because you weren't able to be as engaged. So you're kind of like losing on both fronts almost, which is, which is uh, tough. Um, cool. Uh, next up, we had funding incentives. Um, seems to be a large hurdle for clients to start testing. We were thinking about having other clients sponsor gift cards. Is that something other people are doing? What do you suggest help people hesitant uh, to do this given the cost? Um, thoughts on how to kind of save cost uh, with research, Faison? Whoa. So uh, we typically compensate people for their time because we're in a position to do so. I've definitely worked with companies and partners that couldn't. Um, again, I would think about the fact that you're asking something of your participants and, and you want to give them something back in return, whether that's swag, a gift, direct compensation, maybe a discount on their plan for some period of time. Um, but the one thing I would caution a lot of people on, which is not always obvious, is most companies in the US, and I would imagine other places, have legal implications for compensating participants. Um, after you give them a certain amount of money, you actually have to give them tax forms. And so before you think about too many creative ways to compensate people, I would definitely talk to your legal team. Um, I know the spirit of the question is like how to get around that. And I think you should, we've explored different ways of sort of um, empowering and like thanking people, whether that's shout outs on the blog, whether that's sort of badging in the community. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can do things kind of in the spirit of what your product does. Um, but I, I totally recognize that it's a real challenge. Yeah, I think it's one, um, the, the obvious answer, right, is you try to ask for less of the participants' time. If there is some scaling there. Of the more, if you're going to ask somebody to spend two hours with you, you want to be more generous in, in how you reward them for the time than if you ask them to spend a half hour. So if there's any flexibility in maybe how you could learn something faster, that's, that's one avenue. Um, and then I think what you were getting into in terms of are there discounts to your product or service you could offer? Um, ability to maybe give them a, a more in-depth demo or tutorial features or elevated customer support or something. Um, you know, it, it really does depend on your stage and, and kind of where you're at. Like if you're really small and early, um, sometimes those earliest adopters that are your first users are so passionate about the problem space and what you're trying to build that they're happy to come in and um, engage with you. And, and you can be a little bit, you know, um, you know, it's a little bit of a different dynamic. So it's, it's a tough one, but, um, you know, trying to get creative and, and keeping the legal implications in mind is, uh, is great advice. Um, cool. Uh, there was one around, would like to know if it's possible to conduct moderated user research uh, with remote eye tracking. Uh, if yes, recommend a platform. Uh, eye tracking is not one I'm familiar with. Is that, is that something you've... Um, I, I'm only aware of eye tracking where you have special cameras involved. And I think one of the challenges that you'll run into is most people's webcams are not equipped from a hardware perspective to do the right kind of eye tracking test. If someone out there knows an answer, then I would love to see that in chat. But um, I've, I've only seen eye tracking done with specialized hardware or glasses, and I don't think that scales. Yeah, sorry, this is not one I uh, personally have a ton of context on. So uh, hopefully maybe some other attendees uh, have some ideas for us. Um, I've seen some other good answers in there, so lean on the crowd here. Um, can you talk about how to select the user's online outreach strategies and how to pick a broader set of folks to interview? Yes. Um, some of this is in the talk, which I think Carrie posted, but um, and maybe I'll just give the like the 30 second preview, but like I start with what's the decision we're trying to make and like, is that possible to even make that decision? The next question for me is what evidence do we need to make it? And from there, I can often be really specific about the type of data I want to collect. So who are the people that I need to get feedback from? What kind of feedback is it? quantitative or qualitative? Is it like right now where I need longitudinal data, et cetera? And that process, which I've outlined, often gets me very close to who it is I need to talk to and what kind of data I need to collect from them, which helps shape my approach. The harder question, I think, is how to find those people. And so sometimes that means you can reach out to existing customers. Sometimes that means you have to use things like Twitter, Craigslist, uh, recruiting firms that can help you if they're a specialized audience. Facebook ads, et cetera. Um, and I think for some of the more cold calls, just being clear about why it is that you're reaching out to people. I think a lot of people feel like research requests are spam because they're often untargeted or not specific. And I think the better thing you can do is start small and, and sort of iterate towards a message that resonates. So 
hey, uh, Brenda, I'm reaching out from Slack because I noticed that you're on a bunch of different workspaces and I'm actually really interested in understanding the kind of cognitive overload of switching back and forth. Do you have half an hour for us to chat on the phone? I right? like very pointed, even if we've never talked before, I think it, it's helpful to me explain why I wanted to reach out to you. Um, and I'm happy to answer, like provide some more context on Twitter, or, like in a follow up. Awesome. Yeah, one just general tip that uh, somebody taught me that I like is um, if you are gonna do any sort of like screening or surveying of people before you determine who's a fit, throwing in one sort of like open-ended kind of like articulation question um, of, you know, tell me about the last movie you watched and how did you decide to pick that or whatever. And the people who are just like Rambo, like one word versus the people who are like, I use like real good to track all the stuff that I'm interested in. And I noticed that this one just popped up on Netflix for the first time. And like, well, what, like the person who gives you the more verbose answer is usually going to be, um, you know, a pretty engaging participant. And so something like that is a good way too. if you are able to get a wide set of people and you're trying to narrow it down, some sort of articulation question can, can be really helpful in that regard. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll give a, a quick plug for Jan Chip Chase's book, The Field Study Hand Guide Handbook, um, which talks a lot about like spending time understanding who you're reaching out to and like what a participant's own incentive is to from, like be involved in research is that they want the money, they wanna make the product better, they you know, are looking for social clout or, or whatnot. Um, but I think it's, it's worth spending time on that because good outputs rely on good inputs. And if you have just anyone coming in and being involved in your research, you're probably not gonna get the right feedback. Cool, we, uh, we probably have time for maybe one or two quick ones. Um, so I'll just give a plug for, there's a lot of questions in there right now. So if you see any that are particularly top of mind, uh, hit the upvote so that I see them up the top. Um, just one, one final uh, vote, uh, call for votes. Um, there was one around how do you document remote sessions? I feel like we, we actually covered that pretty well in terms of the recording and note stuff that came up. So uh, maybe we should move on to another one. Here's a Slack one, so uh, I'll give you this. Um, have you used Slack to run diary studies? Um, they mentioned having some good success with that and curious if you've done something similar. Yeah, we've, we've done that in a couple different ways. Um, depending on the company and your, your company's policies, you can do this through shared channels. You can do it by adding guests to Slack. Um, but yeah, we, we've actually been able to set up workspaces and have this kind of interaction um, and it's been great because we're able to ask questions kind of in real time. So we'll often put out an announcement in the channel where it's like, hey, the, the prompt for this week is do this, you know, post back either in, in a direct message or upload this file, et cetera. And then we can have that conversation. Um, so it's, it's been good for us. But again, like it was the right tool for the thing that we were doing. Awesome. Um, Tucker, Bezad, I don't know if you, if you all saw any in there that you thought we should hit before we wrap up. Uh -huh. I like this one about um, going off script from Matthews. When following a script in remote research, how much going off script is acceptable in terms of research accuracy? Ooh, oh, that's a good one to end oh. up. Um, I got thoughts. I think this is like one of the, the most contentious questions when it comes to like rigor and reproducibility and, and other things. Um, so there, there are like many, there's a spectrum of opinions on this. There is the, I think like academic sort of experimentalist, which is um, you need to be consistent in your data collections that you can be consistent in your findings and outcomes. I think that's totally one position to hold. The other one is um, I am building things in the world and I am building things for people and I want those people's feedback and I accept that there is going to be some fuzziness. Um, I am probably somewhere closer to the second opinion where, um, what I do to account for that is I limit the things that I generalize from my work and I'm often very concrete about any conclusions I'm making and tying those back to the specific kinds of feedback. So it's not, hey, users felt X, Y, and Z because one person said it. It was one of the people we talked to had this experience because of X, Y, and Z and that was why we felt this way. And I think we would all be better off. Um, there are going to be times in your work where you need to go off script because you learned something that you didn't know was possible and you want to spend time engaging with that. And that's totally fine. Account for that in how you tell the story and how that you share what you learn because learning those things are going to be super valuable. And I've had projects pivot because of like the second participant saying something where we were just, oh my gosh, we never realized this is what was going on, but now we need to invest all in this. Um, and that's fine. But be, be intellectually honest and say, hey, this is what happened and this is how we learned about it. Um, and I think as long as you're being you know, truthful in that way, that's good. Yeah, I, I think um, to kind of wrap up, I 
I fall kind of in the same camp. Uh, to, to disclose, right, I'm not a uh, user researcher by training. I'm a person who does research as part of my pr product role. Um, but I think sometimes, like, I think it all comes back to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, if you have a specific learning goal, I think you'll be easier to know, like, which tangents or which kind of things that are coming up to, to chase down, because you know if they relate to what you're ultimately trying to learn versus ones that are maybe interesting, but not immediately the area you need to cover. And so you can use that a little bit as, um, you know, to weigh which opportunities to convey. And um, the struggle I have with scripts is that people tend to like write the questions all out and then want to go through them exactly in order. And then usually try to take the notes in that same order. And then the note taking becomes harder. Um, so I tend to, I like to kind of come up with a note template where I have the themes or areas that we want to explore. And then you can take the notes uh, a little bit more free form and then have the list of questions as something that you can kind of use as a reference, but you don't need to feel like you need to go through it in the exact order. Um, and then the last piece is just, um, you know, use your critical thinking, right? Like sometimes if these are your own users and somebody agreed to spend time with you and you wanted to cover, you know, how your playlist UX works or whatever, right? And that person just had a horrible experience in the app and they're just happy to have somebody to vent to. And they're just telling you like how hard it was to reset their password and they're pissed about it or whatever. Um, if you're like rigidly trying to get back to the script instead of like hearing them and kind of like, you know, being a human about that, you're, there's a chance that you're going to make that situation worse. You're going to take somebody who's like already upset and like make them more upset that they didn't get heard when they were trying to tell you something versus if you, you know, pivot and do a little improv and hear them and, and cover that, like you might be able to like turn that around into a positive and then get back to what you were hoping to get to for the remainder of the session. So um, just, you know, really encourage people to use their critical thinking and, and embrace a little improv. Um, but it is great to have, some questions you want to cover and some structure and, and really a specific learning goal, I think can go a long way. Cool. Um, yeah, there's a great comment in here about the difference between semi-structured and structured interviews. And I think for the, the majority of us, like the work we do tends to be semi-structured for the entire purpose of the fact that we don't know all the things that we're going to find and we're picking areas to look at and we're okay with sort of meandering through those worlds. Right. Yeah. And there, and there probably are situations that do require much more structure. So I don't want to be, you know, flippant about that. I think to your point earlier, um, the method and, and what you're doing is, is very, you know, contextual. So obviously if it's a situation that calls for a lot of structure, um, you know, you'd want to adhere to that, but, uh, cool. Uh, well that is about all the time I think we're hoping to spend. Um, so really appreciate everyone hanging out with us for 45 minutes. This was a ton of fun. Um, and wanted to thank, uh, you know, Bezad for being a guest and also, um, <laughs> giving us a place to hang out and chat and feel like we have some socialization in a weird time, uh, surprising how far gifts and emojis go. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks again. Yeah. Thanks everybody for Thank joining. You all. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Todd. Thanks everyone. Awesome. Cheers. Cheers.